water crying and he's worried about them he's not worried about who you're going to marry or where you're going to live what are you going to do with the property make sure you pay your taxes none of that stuff nothing nothing make sure you finish college no concerns on his deathbed he says ya baniya oh my my children my sons inna allah astafa lakum ad-din there's no doubt about it it is allah who has selected the deen for you fala tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun don't you dare die except you, the Shaykh Muslim, and then he says, "Ma min ba'di." What are you going to worship after I'm gone? What are you going to do after I'm gone? What are you going to worship after I'm gone? And he didn't even say, "Man ta'buduna." He said, "Ma ta'buduna," which illustrates he's quizzing them. What is it that you're going to do? What form of worship are you going to take? And they responded, "Na'budu ilahaka wa ilaha abaika Ibrahima wa Ismaila wa Ishaqa ilaha wahida wa nahnu lahu muslimun." We will worship your ilah and the ilah of your fathers. Ibrahim, Ismail, Ishaq, and we are Muslim completely to him. Now I'm going to close Mus'haf inshallah ta'ala and share some practical realities in contrast. Let's compare ourselves to what has just been learned. This is a story of old times. These are great children. At the end of this passage, you know what Allah says? Tilka ummatun qad khalat. That's a nation, they're already gone. They're, already, they, they're past. Lahama kasabat, that group, that nation earned what they earned. وَلَكُمْ مَا كَسَبْتُمْ And you will get what you earned. You don't just think about them and say, Oh, those were the good times. No, 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 no. They got what they got. You will have to earn what you, what you earn. You will have what you earn. وَلَا تُسْأَلُونَ عَمَّا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ You will not be interrogated about what they used to do. What, you, what will you be interrogated about? What you did. Allah's words at the end are, Learn the lesson and change yourself. You won't be asked about whether you know the historical names and figures and dates. And can you name all the sons of Yaqub or not, alayhi salam? What will you be asked? What did you do with your children? What did you do? Now, I, I, inshallah ta'ala, very briefly, I'm going to talk about a, a couple of things that are plaguing our ummah today. You know, we have to understand the time in which we live. If we want to understand the teachings of our deen, we have to understand Qur'an and Sunnah. And we also have to have a good understanding of when we are living, where we are living, what is around us, what's happening in the society around us. That actually happens to be a statement of Ibrahim salam that we find. That a man must know the age in which he lives. There's something we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be aware of our surroundings. You know, the Muslims today, the vast majority of them have lost touch with their religion. And they've become more concerned with the practices of their tradition of the family than they are with the religion. Okay, they're, they're more concerned with their culture than they are with the religion. So when their young son or daughter becomes a little bit religious and says, I want to get married but I want the nikah to be in the masjid. The father says, were you crazy? We don't do that in our family. We'll get a hall. And he's, the son says, or the daughter says, I want the gathering to be separate. I don't want men and women mixing. No, 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 we don't do that in our culture. This is extreme, you're, you're turning into a crazy person. So, we're not, don't be crazy like that. That's not how we do things in our family. That's not our tradition. Have you heard that before? That's not our tradition. Okay, that's not your tradition. If you're, for example, from the Indo-Pak or the Arab society, right? That's not your tradition. But what about your fathers and their fathers and their fathers and their fathers? If you go back seven or eight generations, your great 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 grandfather would have said the same thing that this youth is saying. So whose truth is the tradition? <laughs> who's upholding the tradition? And who's defying the tradition? These, these ideas of we don't do things this way, we don't act like this, this is the hypnosis that the colonizers put on the Ummah of Islam. They came and put these clothes on us, they taught us how to eat with a fork and spoon, right? To know that English is the language of the dignified and Arabic is the language of people who don't really get a good education. Right? They taught us this stuff. And then we got so hypnotized into thinking this is our way. This is our way. SubhanAllah. We have to have a sense of dignity for who we are. For what our legacy is. Our legacy is not 50 years old. I mean, and this is the other thing that happened to this ummah. It is part of our problem today. We think our history, those of you that are from Pakistan, oh, we're a, we're a tradition of 50 years ago, or 70 years ago, right? Or we're a 100 year old country, we're a 200, no, we're a 1400 year old plus ummah. Those lines were not drawn by Muslims, who were they drawn by? By kuffar, by the enemies of Islam. 
Don't think that's our tradition. Our tradition is much bigger than that. Don't limit yourself. Now, having said all of that, let's come back to the United States where we live. And our children, yes, our children are being raised in this society. They're being raised literally as Americans. You like biryani and baklava and whatever you like, they like pizza. You don't like pizza. Right? They like, they like a cheeseburger. You can't stand it. And the things that you laugh at, they don't laugh at. And the things you, the, the things you eat for sweets, they're allergic to. They'd rather have a candy, a chocolate bar. Or something, right? It's a different culture. The, what they like to eat, how they speak, what they like, what, how they entertain themselves is different from you. The elders are sitting together and they're listening to poetry from old times and going, oh, that's good stuff. And their youth, I don't know what they're talking about, man. I have no idea. And he's, he's got 50 cent on, or, you know. Different worlds. Two completely different worlds. So now we, not only do we have a, a, a generation gap between ourselves and our children, we have a continental gap. <laughs> right? Our parents are from a different continent, a different world, where things work entirely differently. But what's happened, and this is my assessment of it, what's happened is, when we come to the United States, we've built these masajid, alhamdulillah, may Allah reward those, put even a penny in the building of the masajid, because if it wasn't for the building of the masajid, we would not be sitting here today. There would be no da'wah of Islam. So we reward, we, we ask Allah to reward the people who spend even a penny for the sake of Allah in building His house. Right? So this is, this is a great contribution to this Ummah. But then what happened is the problem too. Let's talk about the problem too. Let's not only talk about the good, let's talk about the bad too. So we built our masajid and then right now when you, when you turn on Sinat, it's America. And when you turn into a, the parking lot and you park your car, now we're in Pakistan. And when you enter in here, it's Cairo or, or, or Lahore or Hyderabad in here. We've left America. We're in a different country here. Right? And we act that way too. We, you would never do the things you would do in a, in a, a masjid bathroom, in any other bathroom. <laughs> you would never park your car in any other parking lot the way you park it at the masjid. Because you're in Pakistan when you get in here. <laughs> right? It's the, it's the mentality of the Muslim. We, we, we're, we're, so this is an island where we own, it's, back, it's like back, nostalgia from back home. Now the thing is, back home things were a little different. The Imam would come, he would give a dafs in Arabi, he would give a lecture in Urdu, or in Bangla, or in Malay, or in Thai, or, or, or like in Turkish, right? And you would listen and you would enjoy. Is that going to work here? Well, how is that going to work here? And you know why the, the biggest proof that it doesn't work here? The, sh the shuyukh are here, the great scholars are here, and they're wonderful, but when they're talking, who's listening? The elders are listening. Where are their kids? Outside in the parking lot, out in the basketball court. It's a great court, by the way, right? They're, they're in the court. They're not here. They're not here. And masjid after masjid after masjid is having fight over who should be the imam of the masjid. Should it be th from this country? Should it be from that country? Should it be from this madrasa or that madrasa? Should it be from this ideology or that ideology? No matter who you get, guess who doesn't care? Your kids. They don't care. They couldn't care less. So we're fighting over things that don't make any sense. We've left the legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salam. He left it. Our, his primary concern is who? His children. His ch what do we do in this masjid? And every masjid in the United States, what do we do at our masajid that turns this a magnet for young people? Turns this into a place where young people he heard. They flock to it. Instead of a place that they run away from. Instead of a place that they run away from. This is the first concern. And by the way, just to add a little bit of irony to all of this, Ibrahim alayhi salam was building what? When he asked for those future generations. He was building Allah's house. Allah's house has directly something to do with preserving the future generations. If you lose connection with Allah's house, you've lost everything. You've lost everything. The masajid in this country are our refuge. Our refuge. Our youth, now let's talk a little bit about the youth and what their problems are. They're probably the, the number one catastrophe of our youth is they have no one to talk to. That's the number one catastrophe of our youth. Your child goes to school, let's say they go to public school, that's the majority of Muslims, they, they put their children in public school because they can't afford Islamic school or whatever reason, right? We don't blame them for it, that's their circumstance. So they put their children in public school. By 5th or 6th grade, ch your children learn some pretty filthy vocabulary in this country. I don't care what state you're from. 
right? There's some pretty dirty vocabulary. They learn how to access some pretty disgusting websites. They learn how to download some pretty hideous things on their PSPs and iPod videos uh, or uh, iPod touches or, or iPhones or whatever. So they're pretty advanced but at a very early age. Things you would never have learned until you were 25, they know when they're 12. That's the reality. That's what's going on today. So, uh, how many parents here know what Facebook is? You guys know what Facebook is? Show of hands, please. Okay, Twitter. You know what Twitter is? It's not when your eye bugs out. It's something else. Okay, so, so your kids are on these social networking sites where, they have, they, they're, where, where predators, literally predators, have access to talk to your teenage daughter or to your son and to, to engage in relationships with them over, over the internet and eventually they meet up with them and things happen. This is a reality of the Muslim youth today. This is happening. Is we shouldn't close our eyes to it, we need to open our eyes to it. And you say to yourself, nah, not my kids. Nah, not, not my, no, please, wake up. Don't, and some basic solutions, before we talk about the bigger picture and what we need to do at the masajid, some basic solutions, do not have open access internet at home, especially when you have children under the age of 12. Do not. That is a horrible idea. Do not give your children a laptop. Do not give them a machine, a phone, that has anything but phone numbers. No texting. Don't, you, don't give them text message phones. Don't give them internet access phones. You are asking for trouble. You are asking for trouble. You will regret what you did later on. You think you got them these things because you love them? You are destroying them. You are destroying them. They are not smart enough to figure out, I shouldn't be doing that or I shouldn't be doing this. Don't assume that they will make all the good decisions because you come from a nice family. Please don't fall into that trap. For Allah's sake, take those things away. There are other ways to entertain your children. So this is the first thing. When your children become teenagers, by the way, which happens a lot, right? Our children become teenagers. And as I travel the country, you know what happens with a lot of parents? They come to me and they say, I have a teenage girl. I have a teenage boy. I want you to talk to him. This has happened to me hundreds of times. Literally hundreds of times. And you know why they come to me? And I don't, I don't judge anyone. I don't judge anyone. Wallahi, I don't judge anyone. You know why they come? Because when they're teenagers, they become independent. And when they become independent, they no longer listen to you. When they no longer listen to you, you have to find somebody that they will listen to. The ship has already sailed. When was your chance? When was your chance? Before they turned into to semi-adults. That was your chance. Take, don't lose that opportunity. The thing that we have to learn here is we're in a different world. The way you deal with your children back home is not the way you deal with them here. They're two different things. Back home you can yell at them, slap them, do whatever. It's all good. That's how everybody does it. Over here you yell at them a little, they'll go and talk, yeah, my dad, he's a total loser. They'll talk about, you, you like that. They will, among the friends, they will talk. I used to run a Sunday school, I was the, the head of a Sunday school, and my job, primary job, you know what it was? It was to be a spy. That was my prime. it wasn't curriculum, or am I teaching Aqidah, or what textbooks to order, no, 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 no. That will come later. Let me go around during recess and spy on the conversations these kids are having. My mom let me buy an NC-17 video game, and I'm only eight. She loves me. No, she doesn't. <laughs> I have Grand Theft Auto, whatever, 85 now, right? Is, and did you see that movie? It's PG-13, but I still got to go see it. Or it's rated R and I've seen it. We even have the DVD at home. This is what the kids are talking about. You're messing your kids up. You think you love them? This is love? This is what Ibrahim salam. Would he approve of anything near this? Anything near this? is concern for children? Wake up. Really, wake up. We've, we've you know, uh, exposed our children to things in this society, it's, it's gone progressively worse, in media especially. So a movie that was PG-13 10 years ago is PG now. Okay, the, the standards have dropped. They, they're talking about it. It's not even me. They're talking about it. Right? So, uh, and you know, for example,